Welcome to Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. Each week, you will learn how to grow your wealth through real estate investing, be introduced to the players that are getting it done, and learn how you can get involved. And now, here's your host, Darren Batchelder. Hello, everyone. Today, we have a very special guest with us today. We have David Lindahl. David, I appreciate you coming on the show. My pleasure. Absolutely. So just a little bit on how I know David. So um, this is actually the first time that David and I will be speaking. Um, but when I started, it's it's a great honor to have him on today because when I started investing three years ago, you know, I did what most people do. I, fir- I went out and started to look for books to read and podcasts to listen to. And, you know, David Lindahl had a couple books that I read, um, Multifamily Millions and Emerging Real Estate Markets. Those two books were some of the first books I read on multifamily. So uh, when his assistant, Jeannie, reached out to me and said, hey, would you be interested in having David on? I was like, absolutely. So I am excited about this. Um, David, typically I start, we'll get into the books in a little bit, but I typically start by just asking, you know, are you still an investor? And if so, how many properties and how many units are you invested in? I have been investing since 1996. So first and foremost, I am an investor. Uh, one time we were up over 8,000 units. Wow. We are at the precipice of a new, uh, I shouldn't say precipice. We are at the, you know, the, the bottom of a new cycle. So as every cycle cycles out, you know, you shed units. We shed it down to about 1,500 units right now, but we are about to run again. You know, it's been nice for the last couple of years. It's been, we've been doing one-off deals. Uh, it's a nice break to have. It's time to have a life again. And then when this COVID opportunity hits, it's, it's off to the uh, off to the races for another two or three years. It's going to be great. Uh, absolutely. So um, let's start with the books because that's where, where I got to know you. Um, uh, never met you before, but, you know, one, thank you for writing the books because, look, it it's a lot of work to put out a book and um, for people that are new looking to get in the space it's just a great way to to educate yourself so um, you know when I picked those two I picked up multifamily millions first and then when I was done with that I was craving more and I ended up buying your other book uh, you know emerging real estate markets and both of them were great so talk about you know why'd you um, why'd you even write the books I didn't plan on writing those books. Um, a short version of my story is I went, I joined a rock and roll band when I was 17 years old, left home, did that band till I was about 24. You got 24. the short, clean cut haircut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I got a whole bunch of stories too. But at 17, <laughs> you probably didn't, it was probably a little longer. Oh, I had long hair. I had, <laughs> uh, you know, tassels on my, up to my knees and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. We almost made it, made it big. Uh, once, but we didn't. At 24, I left the band. But you know, during that cycle of being in the band, I, you know, I embarrassed my parents. I was the degenerate child, and so I had a lot of making up to do. So I started when I left the band. I started a landscaping company that turned into a construction company, so I could get some money during the winter times around here. And then I started Calton Sheets, uh, and I got his course. And then I started an interview uh, about investing in multifamily properties with Harry Helmsley. Actually, it was a biography. And Barry Helmsley started in New York City, started buying and selling apartment buildings, and ended up owning the Empire State Building. Oh, wow. And when the interviewer said, Harry, what was it about apartment buildings that got you going? Harry said, I always liked the idea that a group of people would give me money every month to pay off my building, pay off the mortgage. They'd give me money every month so I could pay a maintenance guy to swing a hammer, take out the trash, clean the toilets. They'd give me money every month so I could hire a management company to collect their rents and, and take their phone calls. And they would give me so much money that at the end of the month, after I paid those bills, I would have extra money to reinvest, to put into a savings account or just go out and have some fun with. And a light bulb went off in my head when I heard that. And I thought, my God, if that's true, I want in. And he said, you, he started with no money. It's like, if that's true, I want in. And uh, I found out it was true. For the first three to six years, I would only buy small properties, three to six unit deals because I was afraid to buy anything bigger. It took me nine months to get into my first deal. There was nobody out there teaching multifamily back then. Um, so there was a lot of fear involved. But after I did that first deal, within three years, I had three. Within six months, I had nine. And within the first year, I had 11. Within the first three years, I had almost 40 of those deals. Wow. And then I learned about market cycles. My market was peaking out and I had gained a lot of equity in that time. 
And I thought I could either go in cash or find another market like my market, Brockton, Massachusetts was when I first started. Um, and so I started learning about job growth, household formations, and I went down to Montgomery, Alabama. I did a 40 unit deal, which was enormous for me at the time. Uh, I would I would have done three to six units in Montgomery if I could, but I had too much equity in my 1031 exchanges. So I did a 40, I did an 80, uh, and then I realized it was actually easier to do the bigger deals than it was the smaller deals. Uh, and then I did, and that's because everybody that's associated with the deal gets paid off the size of the deal. So they get more money and you get a better quality person, like um, uh, uh, the managers, the brokers, the, the lending people, everybody. So then uh, I went from there to a 350 in Jackson, Mississippi, and then I went to Texarkana, from, from Texas. 40, 60 to, to 350. 48, yeah, three, yeah, because yeah. it's all about cash flow. Yeah. yeah. Yep, it's all about the cash flow. And, you know, if you get a, if you get what I call a momentum play, a property that will cash flow at the closing, and you buy it uh, at, with the right numbers, then it's an easy deal to manage. And, and I don't, you, you, I teach and I don't manage myself. I always have, a, I asset manage and I have a property manager manage. So, anyways, to get to the story, so I went to Texarkana. I did two deals there. Uh, and then while I was there watching my properties one night, um, I was I was I was inspecting them and um, I was eating at the local restaurant and I was sitting at the bar because I was by myself. And there was a guy next to me started chatting me up and we started talking and and he asked me what I was doing down here because I obviously didn't have a southern accent. And I explained to him you know why I, that I was buying apartments and he has, and he's like why here you know it's so far from Boston. And I explained to him my concept of emerging markets. And he said, I, I, I'm, an, um, I'm a reporter for Kiplinger's Magazine. I write articles for them. Could I, would you be interested in having an article written about you and what you're doing? And I said, and I thought to myself, my father reads Kiplinger's Magazine. You know, here I am, the degenerate kid trying to make up for my past. And I thought, that, wait, my father would be, you know, amazed if all of a sudden it plopped on his, his doorstep. That, and I was that's in great. It. So I said, absolutely. So I did. And my father was, he was like, what? And he was, by the way, he was the one that told me if I started investing in multifamily properties, I was going down. He was one of the naysayers. You oh, know, he was. People. Oh, yeah. I had to stop talking to him about it. I have dinner with him every Monday night, still do. And back then, though, I was like, hey, dad, I got this big idea. I'm going to start investing in multifamily properties. And I explained the Harry Helmsley story. And he was like, Dave, you do that. You're going down, kid. <laughs> you're going Because I was a kid in the rock and roll band, you know, the crazy yeah. kid. So um, after that article came out, about two months later, I got a call from um, Richard Naramore from Wiley, um, um, the book publisher. And he said, I read the article in Kipling. Just, would you be interested in writing a book about that? And I thought, wow, that would make my mother really proud. So uh, I did. I wrote the first book, Emerging Real Estate Markets. That was number one bestseller for a long time. The foundational information in there is still still relevant today. Um, and then after that did so well, they asked me to write a second book, uh, and I did, and that was Multifamily Millions. So those are my back-to-back -back books back then, and that was the, that was the whole reason for writing the book. So Emerging uh, Real Estate Markets came out first, and then yeah. Multifamily Millions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they wanted a follow-up. So That's I did that. That's awesome. So you were you still in your twenties back then when when you wrote wrote the uh, book? No, I was in my thirties. Thirties, okay. Yeah, I just entered uh, my early thirties. That's awesome, and and here we are, and the books are still relevant, and they're still oh, helpful, yeah. and you know they were some of the foundation for me when I got involved like three years ago, and so I'm fifty. I was like forty seven when when I started reading them, and I wish I had started a long time ago. But um, that's fantastic. So then. Um, you're you're an investor. Um, you start. Uh, you write an article. You write a couple books, and then yeah. you also have a mentorship program. Correct. Yeah. So about ten years into the business, I owned about eight hundred units at that time. Uh, the books came out, and then um, and then I had so many people contacting me from the books. I thought, well, you know, I might as well create another form of income and start teaching how to do this. And that's what I did back in 2002. I started teaching how to invest in multifamily properties. Started with a home study system, uh, went to a three-day live event, then to a coaching program. And now we've got uh, um, just a whole bunch of rele relevant courses like how to raise private money, how to do asset management, all of that. We take people from the very beginning to, you know, how to – we've had students now scale well over 10,000 units since we've been teaching people how to do it. How crazy They've surpassed my, my, my total goals. Yeah, you know, the thing about – the thing about it is, you know, there are some students that they just, we call it a family. They stay in the family. They keep in contact. You know, we see them at different events and they visit us when they're in Boston here at the office and, and it's great. And then some people just learn it and go. 
And then you don't hear from them. Like, for instance, um, there's these three brothers there. They're sons of a preacher in Kansas City. They're the Worcester brothers. And um, they were with us about six or seven years ago. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, you know, somebody, oh, my, one of my partners said, hey, you know, the, there's these uh, two brothers out of, there's actually three, but one of them left the company. He said, there's, there's the two brothers out of uh, Kansas, and uh, they're interested in perhaps, you know, partnering some deals. And I said, great. And he said, oh, their last name is Worcester. And uh, it's actually it's pronounced Worcester. And there's a Worcester, Massachusetts. And you know, it's very similar. People from out of the state pr pronounce it that way. And I said, the Worcester, the Worcester brothers, I said, is it Jesse Worcester? And he says, yeah. I said, I know them. You know, they came through the system a few years ago. I said, how are they doing? He said, oh, they've done over 4,000 units now. And they're excited that possibly JV. So, you know, there we go. You give them the information, they go out and they just they just do it. Yeah, that's, so. that's fantastic. Actually, um, I interviewed somebody a couple weeks ago, um, and she'll be on the show recently, um, coming up here shortly, and uh, by the name of Aaron Hudson, who oh yeah was it was in your group and um, mm -hmm. and learned from that, and and actually her business partners came, you know, from your groups. They formed a company called Quattro Capital, but um, yeah, it's 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 funny. I mean, that must be. Um, I don't know, it must give you a lot of joy to <clears throat> be able to share your knowledge and then have other people, you know, really achieve success uh, based on, on that. The, so the way, the, the, the way it changes lives, it's the most rewarding thing. You know, here we know the system works. So if you, if you simply follow it step by step, but we've seen it work for other people through the years <clears throat> and it, you obviously have to work the system for it to work. And for those people that actually work the system and, you know, we've had, I think a Jackie Hughes whose husband was killed in Iraq and she was left with two nine months old uh, twins and a nine year old daughter in a one bedroom apartment. Now she's living on a 123 acre horse, horse ranch with those kids because of what she was able to do with multifamily. And there's so many different stories like that. There was one time I was so burnt out because I had been buying so many, we were, we were averaging one and a half deals, a um, hundred plus units a month for almost a three year period. Plus oh, the, this, this business took off. There was nobody out there teaching multifamily at the time. So, you know, it just took off. And I was traveling everywhere for a good five or six year period. And I just got tired of it. And I came back, I went over to a trip to Tanzania. The government invited me and, and four other entrepreneurs from America to try to explain how the um, entrepreneur system works here. Uh, so they could try to create one over there. Um, and we also, we, it was part of the mission too. We were building a church over there that had burned down. So um, when I came back from that trip, I thought to myself, you know, I'm going to I'm going to quit the education business. I'm going to focus on my properties and I'm even going to wind them down and just relax for a while. And that was right about Christmas time. And I, when I walked through the door, um, there was so many like different cards and cho people know I love dark chocolate. So the, the dark chocolates and all these different notes about, you know, how their lives had changed. And I thought, you know, this is you know, this is really one of the reasons I was meant to be here. So I'm going to just learn how to delegate, which I wasn't doing. I was doing everything. I'm going to learn how to delegate, and I'm just going to keep it going. And we did. And we've got so many more success stories because of that. that it's been great. That's, you, you know, that's I, I suffered a clinical death when I was a kid. I suffered you a what? clinical death when I was a kid, a clinical death when I was four and a half years old. I had double pneumonia. Both my lungs collapsed. Oh, my God. I was uh, on the – they had experiment. They, I had become allergic to all medication. They had shot me everywhere with uh, injections through that six-month period. And uh, they get to the point where uh, they rushed me to children's hospital. Uh, they started giving me experimental drugs. And they told my parents I wasn't going to make it. You know, if, they said, if he makes it till tomorrow, then we'll give him this, this, and this. And if he makes it till the next day, we'll give him this, this, and this. They told my father to plan the funeral, uh, which he did. Uh, my mother had a complete nervous breakdown. And um, that last day, I was on the operating table. And all I remember was floating up above it. Looking back at it, seeing everybody frantically working on this four and a half year old body, frail. And uh, I remember looking up and seeing two figures. One was my grandfather and one was a sister that had died before I was born. And, and it's like, how do you know that? It's like when you, when you cross over there, you know, it's like there's an all knowledge, all knowing. And I looked at them and they were greeting me to take me. And I looked back at that body. And as soon as I looked back, it was like a vacuum. It went, <laughs> sucked me back in. And then boom, I was awake in the post-op and my father was there. And I remember him saying, He'll never eat that peanut butter sandwich. He's a picky eater. It's been there all day. And I woke up and I looked at it. I must have been starved because I was like, and I, I ate the whole thing. And so from that period, I had a difficult childhood. And I always figured, like, why was I brought back? Some of it was so difficult. And I would think to me, and I did a lot of drugs when I was a, I joined that rock and roll band because I was a complete degenerate, you know, and I just, 
I was crazy and I was self-medicating myself with, with alcohol and booze and all that. And I would think to myself, uh, why was, why am I here? You know, what was the purpose? And then I started investing in multifamily properties and I started making money. I come from a very middle-class family and I got my, I taught my brothers and sisters how to do it. We all started doing better. And I thought, this is it. That's why I'm here. And then when the opportunity came to teach, I, I started teaching and I started changing lives and I thought, this is it. That's why I'm here. You know, so, it, it, and I think there's even a bigger purpose. I haven't figured it out yet, but it's definitely one of them. That's huge. Um, that's huge. Look, uh, um, you know, I have a family, two kids. One, my my son is a sophomore in Texas A&M. My daughter is a senior in high school. And, you know, as a dad and as a husband, you know, I'm trying to have an impact on my family. But, you know, in life, I think that, People just want to have an impact on so many more people. And so, you know, what kind of platform can you use to do that? And, you know, you're very blessed that you were successful in writing two books, creating a, you know, a mentorship group where you've touched the lives of so many people. Mm. And, you know, I think that's bigger than just pure financial success for you. You know, um, Absolutely. you know, so helping others is, is just a tr true joy. So that that's that's fantastic. It's the best and business to be in. Best business to be in. Yes, absolutely. So um, you talked about uh, fear in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you were afraid. Talk about talk about that a little bit, because I think there's there's a lot of listeners. There's, and I'm sure you've run across this with your mentorship program. I have people reach out to me on Instagram and otherwise and at meetup groups and they want to get in, you know, but there's some people that either don't feel like they're worthy or mm -hmm. just can't get over the hump and do it. And so talk about how you were able to press on, you know, even though you were scared. Yeah, so you're right. I mean, uh, all the years that we've been teaching too, I see the same thing in most of the students is that is that fear barrier. That you know, getting into that first deal, it's fear of the numbers. Uh, it's fear of um, you know, am I making a mistake? Will I be able to raise the money? Will I be able to close the deal? A big one is, am I worthy? You know, you, all these limiting beliefs that come from early on in life, you know, that people carry with them. And a lot of people don't even realize they have them. Right. So I had, a, I, my biggest one was, am I worthy? You know, I just didn't, I would look at these buildings and think, who am I to own this? Right. You know, and why should, you know, who am I to be successful? Um, so I'll tell you in my teaching, you know, it took me three years to understand this. I just thought, you know, I didn't even think of myself as an example, but when I learned that, that you could do hundred unit deals and it was so much easier and you'd make so much more money, that's what I taught the first three years, do hundred unit deals. And then my student base wasn't as successful as I thought they should be, you know, with the system step by step. And I started going back and calling people and saying, hey, you know, how come you're not doing deals? What is it? What, what, what's difficult about this? And they're like, oh, you know this and you know that. And I finally figured out it was mindset. You know, it was I was teaching them to do 100 unit deals and, and, and subconsciously they didn't think they were ready to do 100 unit deals, even though, you know, they were trained to do it and they could do it, but they weren't ready for it. And their right. subconscious was sabotaging them. So I, I, I shifted that around to um, 100 unit deals are, are, will make you more money and they're easier, but start where you're comfortable. The most important deal that you do is that very first one because right. a lot of people don't get, get, get that first one done. It's also your most difficult deal. But what I've discovered is once you get that first deal done, in order to do that deal, you've had to put your team together. You've had to put your systems in place. And after you do it, now you realize it does work and you have all the confidence in the world, the systems in place, your teams together, and the deal flow starts coming in behind it. So that's why we see, you know, for me, I wasn't an anomaly where it took me nine months to do my first deal. And then, you know, within three months, I had three more and six, I had nine. And we see that all the time here. You know, after that first one gets done, it's like flowers blossoming over and over again. So in order, so how did I get over my fear? Uh, it was really, I got a partner my best friend to do it. Cause I, I figured if I was going to go down, I better take somebody with me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were both broke. So we didn't have much follow to go was down. He, anyway. Was he one of your band members? <laughs> no, he was, he was just a friend, my, my best friend since we were 10 years old. Gotcha. He lived across the railroad tracks. And um, so I took him with me and we were bird dogging for other people. Um, we knew we had, we were able to recognize good deals, but we were just too afraid to pull the trigger. Um, and then, uh, so we were bird dogging for two to 4,000 per deal. And then finally, nine months into it, there's, there's three family with four bedrooms on each floor. The more bedrooms you have on each floor, the money you're going to make. 
they came on the market and uh, we tried to bird dog it to two or three different people. And it was almost like, you know, the hand of God came through their clouds and just slapped us both. It's like, come on, I put a lot of good deals in front of you. Take this one. And uh, we bit the bullet. We took that one. And that was the start of it. That's funny. And I'll tell you, I don't know what we look like, but it was a bank deal. And we went and we closed that deal with credit cards because we didn't have any money. So we went to a seminar that said, get as many credit cards as you can, get them with the non-recurring fees, use those for your down payment. And we did. So it was a bank deal. The bank wasn't there at the closing. The attorney was. He comes in, he looks at the paperwork, and he looks at us. He looks at the paperwork again, he looks at us. And I don't know what we looked like back then, but he leaned forward and said, do you guys know what you're doing? And I was like, what? He goes, do you have any idea what you're getting into? And I'm like, holy crap, you know, all these people have told me, don't do it, you're crazy, This is all these bad things are gonna happen. And now the attorneys at the closing what? is trying to tell us not to do it. And I just said, you know, please just give me the paperwork, I gotta sign it, give me the keys, I gotta get out of here. And we did. But that was the that was the start of that it. That was the start of it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think that that's important for people to hear is that, you know, I've had a lot of people on on that. To your point, you know, they 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 got the first deal done, and now they have two three thousand units, but they were scared on their first deal. You know, oh, and yeah. some of them came from the single family world where the you know they they were buying single family, and then they you know started scaling up into multifamily, but you know, they'll talk about how buying that first house was, you know, when you said, start where you're comfortable, you know, look, some people say that, that buying that first house was the scariest thing, you know, so mm-hmm. it's a matter of, of being able to pull the trigger on something. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm in that camp, I bought a new construction duplex um, about three years ago, and it was going to take a year to build. And, I was scared signing the contract for that thing. And I had the capital. I mean, I was 47 years old. I, it wasn't like I didn't have the capital. Um, mm-hmm. But it was still something I had never done before. I'd always invested in stocks and, you know, ETFs and, and what, you know, everybody kind of trains you to do. Um, and so it was scary. But once I did that, I was like, man, I'm glad I did it, but I'm not, it's going to take forever to build any wealth. I want to go bigger. Right. And, <laughs> yeah, and so absolutely. that's when I started looking for ways to go bigger. And I joined a mentorship group here in Dallas and, and uh, met a ton of other people. And when you start surrounding yourself with a bunch of other people that have done it, then all of a sudden it gives you that, that courage, you know, and that look, if they can do it, I can do it, you know? Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, you know, I used to have an office on 1717 McKinney. We own so many units in the Southwest. I Is own over right? 4,000 4, plus in Dallas. We actually did the largest multifamily transaction in 214 in the state of Dallas, where that we sold off, I think it was 4,200 units. In one one in transaction? One transaction. Holy yeah. cow. Now, you live in Boston? I do, just okay. south of Boston. So I'm originally from Connecticut, so I'm pretty familiar with the East Coast. I went to school, University of Rhode Island, and, so and I, I grew I up in I, Connecticut. You don't have a team, so I was a Red Sox fan. So Oh good. I was just about to ask yeah. you, Red yes. Sox or Yankees? Red so you Sox. were on the right side of the fence. <laughs> I was. <laughs> Unfortunately, my son, he 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 wanted to go against me growing up, so he, he picked the Yankees. But um Oh yeah. man. Yeah. Well but, now we have the last laugh, right? We we we've won more uh championships uh in the century than the Yankees have. Uh, Fenway is a very cool spot. Um and I lo- and I love Boston. Um so Talk about you. You brought up your childhood a bit in a couple stories. One, you you brought up, um, you know, the the near death experience, which is crazy. Mm. Uh, you also <clears throat> brought up that you were, you know, look, you had a rebellious side, and you you were, you know, um, out there in a rock band, and you were self medicating, and you were partying. And how many brothers and sisters, um, and kind of where did you fall into the mix? Uh, two brothers and a sister. Uh, my oldest brother was the oldest. I came second. My sister was the only girl. And my younger brother was the youngest. So I was in the middle. I didn't have a title. And so I had to be a little loud to get some attention. Your, your dad <laughs> was, was kind of a naysayer in terms of getting into the investment world. How, you know, were they, how'd you grow up? You, um, you my said father you were two, two jobs to support us. My mother okay. was a fish cutter on the fish fairs of Boston. My father was, we're Swedish in heritage and uh, Swedes are known for being very, very frugal. My father was very frugal. 
I actually, we never ate out at a restaurant. Um, I remember I was the one that was always yell, yell, like yelling, hey, there's an ice cream stand, let's go get some ice cream. And his response would be, we got some at home. And I would say, oh, it's all gone now. And he would say, you have to wait till Saturday. And when my mother went shopping to get more. So, I mean, we, we self-rationed each other when we were growing up as kids. If we saw somebody taking too much food, it's like, hey, that's gonna last until Saturday. So, you know, put some back. Uh, and that's basically how we grew up. I mean, we grew up in a, a big family of love, but my mother was uh, an envelope lady. You know, she she did her budgets with the money going to envelopes. I, did, I think I first realized that we didn't have a lot of money when I walked into the kitchen one day and she had all the envelopes out. I was like, Ma, what are you doing? She goes, oh, I'm doing my budgets. You know, this is the money I get in for the week and this is this envelope goes for the clothes and this envelope goes for food and this one goes for the heat and this one goes for the gas for the car and this and that. And I was like, hey, you got, you got $2 left over there. Where's that go? She goes, oh, that's my spending money. I was like, Wow. Oh, wow. I think we're poor. Um, but uh, to go back to the story about not eating at restaurants. So I remember going to school one day, I think I was seven or eight years old. And one of the kids says, uh, oh, yeah, we went out and had Chinese food last night. I was like, you went out to a Chinese restaurant? And they said, oh, yeah, you know, I'm part of this dance group. And that's what you do after the recital. You go out, everybody, they take everybody out to a Chinese, re to a Chinese restaurant. I went home that day and I said, mom, I want to learn how to dance. And uh, I told my brother and sister, my younger brother was too young, but I told my brother and sister, I said, hey, if we go to this dance group, you know, they'll take us out for Chinese restaurants at the end. They will have good Chinese food. And they're like, mom, we want to dance too. <laughs> so we did this thing called, we were on stage doing three blind mice, tap dancing to three blind mice, um, just so we could go to a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> That's funny. That's really funny, man. Uh, yeah. Man. Well, you know what? I think part of the times were a little different too when we grew up. Um, I don't remember going out to eat very much either. And, and uh, my parents had more money, but it was just, it wasn't as commonplace as it is today, um, I think, but who knows. Um, so when you were a kid and you saw all that, was there a time when you thought to yourself, look, when I grow up, I'm going to be different. I'm going to find success no. and so you didn't you did not have that at all in your mind it was ingrained into me that other people get the good stuff other people get nice things you know isn't it great that they can do that isn't it too bad that that we can't and that was just over and over again my mother was would say that you know my father he was my brother my father was very quiet and he wasn't around that much um so that's the way i grew up and it wasn't until i started i left the band i started doing the the landscaping company and i saw i I, um, I found a tape called uh, The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale. So uh, he talked, that's like a 45 minute CD. You can, watch, you can listen to it on YouTube now. But that was just basically talked about how if you think differently, your life can be different. And then the next thing I got was a cassette uh, uh, series called Lead the Field by Earl Nightingale. And I went through that and that was about goal setting. And I started, and I started doing what it said. And I started realizing that my life was changing when I was doing it. So I went out and got books, um, The Magic of Thinking Big, uh, Tony Robbins, um, uh, Awaken the Giant Within, you know, Raise the Bar. I started feeding myself all of that stuff. And that's how my life changed. I remember one time, so I started a bunch of different businesses. It was construction, real estate. When I started uh, doing a lot of real estate, I was flipping single family houses so I could get more multifamily properties. And then I started a brokerage company uh, because, um, you know, since I was flipping so many for myself, I thought, well, I could probably start a business, you know, doing it for other people, have agents. When I brought all the company, companies together for a Christmas party uh, one year, um, my, my mother and father were famous about telling my degenerate stories, you know, all the things <laughs> they caught me doing and all that. Right, right. And so they would love to tell those stories. So one of the guys comes over and he says, uh, hey, I was just talking to your parents. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, what story did they, what story did they tell you? And um, they said and he said, um, they said you were adopted. I said, what? They said, I'm not adopted. And they said, yeah, they, they, that's all they can figure, you know, that somebody switched the babies at the hospital because you're not like the other kids, <laughs> you know, you think differently than everybody else. And the reason that I thought differently was because I was feeding myself all of that mindset stuff. And that's, I continue to. That's huge. I mean, I think that there, so it, it impacts so many people and what you tell yourself in your own head, you know, is, is so important. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that people get caught up in the, all right, well, you know, how do I underwrite? How do I get this deal? How do I do like in all that stuff? You, look, you need to learn how to do all that stuff. But if you don't believe in yourself and you don't have mm -hmm. confidence in yourself, 
it's going to be very difficult for you to take that that leap of faith because yeah all those steps you've never done it before so you there has to be a little bit of of faith that you're going to figure it out along the way yeah there's a couple of things with that um <clears throat> number one <clears throat> it's it's what you're telling yourself but it's the ability to catch yourself telling yourself something negative and spinning it into something either neutral or positive that's a real that's an acquired skill nobody has it there's a book called super brain and it, it's written by a Harvard MD. It's, it's, it, it explains why your, your brain is wired to go to the negative, And then it tells you what you can do to catch that and go to the positive. So, so give an and, example. Uh, um, just when you're thinking about uh, something, just when you're talking to yourself about um, maybe about getting up in the morning to work out. You know, oh, you know, I don't need to work out today because, you know, or I don't feel like working out today because, right. well, that's a negative thought. You got to turn that around or, you know, I can't stop eating sugar, which is my problem, but I, <laughs> I work on it constantly. So even like uh, when you when you look at a property, I can't do that deal. Well, why can't you do that deal? Well, I can't do that deal because it's too big for me. When well, you catch that, you spin it around and to I can't do that deal to how can I do that deal? How can it's I a big difference. That? Right. Yeah. Uh, on how you think. That's a that's a that's a key phrase right there, too, is when you catch yourself saying you can't, you spin it around to how can I? But you got to catch yourself first. So the, the book that I've read recently, and this is like a lifelong thing, this mindset thing, because yeah. your brain is wired to both the negative. I, re I, I read a book by Dr. Joe Dispenza called Superhuman. That book is is amazing. Um, and that just talks about uh, it's a, the uh, meditation is involved, and it just it goes into seeing yourself into what you want to be. Not only that, there's this thing, it, it gets really deep. It talks about going into a quantum field where all knowledge begins, putting a thought into that quantum field, and then and spinning it off, and then creating what you really want. Um, and and you know when I was reading that book and I started doing what it said, I thought to myself, I wonder if he's the same guy that read the science of getting rich, because I see the same similarities, you know. And so I went in the science of getting rich. I have in my top drawer. I highlighted it and I read the highlights every week. And uh, I opened up the, the the beginning, and it wasn't written by Dr. Dr. Joe Dispenza. It was written by some other guy in 1910. Oh my goodness! 1910. Yeah, I was like, wow. And then I just recently I read Think and Grow Rich like three times, and this is when I first started back in 1996. So I just recently started reading Think and Grow Rich again. I was like, oh my gosh, this is the same as Joe's book as uh, the science of getting rich and you know, it's all the same stuff. It's all about what you manifest inside of your mind. Is that's right. what that's what you're going to become. And, so, and look, so you've important. accomplished so much, but then once you hit, you know, one goal, like you look back and two or three years ago, it, that that goal would have seemed insurmountable and probably, you know, it seems so so big. But now you look back and you're like, oh, I, I, you know, I wrote a book and now I'm writing my second book and now it's it's you because you've done it. And then you set another goal, but yeah. you still have to learn and build and and focus on that mindset stuff to achieve that next goal that you haven't done. Yeah, because um, in multifamily investing and in most things in life, there's anxiety for, for doing something that you haven't done before. There's always anxiety there. So you first learn how to harness. First, you set your goal. Then you you know you you set your steps to get that goal, and then you have to learn how to harness the anxiety. Uh, to get that goal and the and the negative mindset um, that's going to happen when you're going after that goal. You know how I used to describe it when I was younger and and I was first starting to become successful, is that you know it's kind of like a gopher borrowing out of the out of the ground and um, it borrows out and then it reaches its goal and it sees the sunshine and it's a bright sunny day and it's like wow I made it right and all of a sudden it realizes it's not really outside. There's another top you know to the world that he's just discovered. So he looks at the top of that, and then he starts borrowing his way up again, and then, then he breaks through. He's like, "Wow, I made it!" And he looks around again. The sun shining, and but all of a sudden he realizes it's not the sun. There's actually another top, you know, because every time you reach a goal, you know, you've accomplished that goal. Now it's now you start looking around. It's like, "All right, what else can I do?" Right. And that's the way you know you live life like that. And before you know it, you know you look back. A lot of times you don't even take the time to look back and see what all of you've accomplished. You know, I think a lot of us, uh, the type A personalities, the entrepreneurs, we're always looking ahead. What what, what can I do next? Instead right. of just resting for a bit, looking back and going, wow, you know, I, I came from that and I've done all of that. Wow. Absolutely. I mean, celebrate some of the wins along the way for sure. Um, mm -hmm. What about, and I haven't asked this question to, to, I don't think any of the guests so far, 
Um, but with, you know, where you came from, what you achieved, all the letters and, and dark chocolate <laughs> that, that you've gotten at your house. Like, have you ever like had what they call the imposter syndrome? Like, holy cow, I have all these people that are reading my book, you know, looking at me as, as, you know, a teacher, a mentor, I have these programs and these study courses, and I know I've helped touch the lives of so many people, but I'm just a man, you know? And so how, early and, on, when I first started teaching and I was going up on stage, and I was teaching that three day event. And when I first started teaching, I had 800 units. Um, and then as I was teaching and going through the years, I was accumulating and I get up to over 8,000. And what I was doing, I was actually teaching the people you know, uh, that was learning from me how to do it along the way. But yeah, at the very beginning, I had imposter syndrome uh, to the max. I would think to myself, why are these people, why are these people listening to me? You know, and I can see that guy over there. He thinks it's all BS. And people would ask me questions from the mic and they get really intricate and, and, um, and they try to stump me, you know, to, to prove that I didn't know what I was talking about. But then I realized it wasn't so much that I didn't know that, that the questions that they asked me were based on it wasn't that I didn't know what I was talking about. It was more based on what was the what was the flaw in their rationale to, in asking that question, you know. So at first it would stump me. I'd be like, "Holy crap!" You know, everybody now thinks it, it, it's BS because this person caught something that, you know, that they think isn't real. And uh, and then after a couple of times of being flustered on stage and, and thinking about it after, I was like, "Wait a minute! The, what they asked me really wasn't relevant to you know their their conclusion wasn't wasn't true." So why wasn't it true? And then I figure it out. And then I get good at actually figuring it out from stage. So when they would ask me these things, I would be like, well, you know, the reason that your, your reasoning is flawed is because of this. And then after you get on stage for, you know, a number of times and you keep getting, you know, different questions, you know, then you start teaching that because then, then you realize that people are perceiving what I'm teaching wrong. So therefore I need to teach it a different way so they get it the right way. Um, and then, you know, I've done what I teach. So I mean, I've gotten past well over 8,000 units. So I'm certainly not an imposter anymore in, inside of my head. And to see so many people use it and become successful themselves, we just know it works. I mean, one of the things I'll, if I'm doing a presentation, I'll say, you know, this system has been proven since, since 2002. We know it works. You know, the question is, is will you work the system? Because if you work the system, you'll get the same results. Right. Absolutely. So the way I look at it is, you know, look, those people that reach out on Instagram and, and otherwise, everybody has value to offer. You know, there's people that um, I bring on the show that have 3000 units and there's some listeners that can't relate to that person because there's, they haven't gotten their first deal yet. And, yeah. and so, you know, person that maybe just got their first deal, you know, or is close to getting their first deal, maybe a better person to relate to that that the listener that need, just needs to get over the hump. So we all are at different stages of our lives. We all have value to, to provide and it doesn't mean that we have to all be a know it all. We don't, that's, you know, just help the next guy do what you did. And, yeah. and that's what you've done. And, and then you invested, you invested your time and your money into writing books and building courses. And of course you earn income off of that. There's a return. Yeah. It's a business. It's a business. <clears throat> yeah. But providing value for value. Exactly. You're helping other people achieve something they want to achieve mm -hmm. by teaching them how you did it. And, and so, um, you know, I applaud people like you that spend the time to do it because it's not easy. And you know, it's one layer after another layer. Um, and like you said, you traveled all over the place, you know? Oh man. Yeah. I traveled so much, um, that I actually got into, uh, have you ever heard of the mind body syndrome? No. My body went into a pain period for about two years where I was to, I got to a point where I was totally disabled. The pain, which I thought was coming from my spine, which my, I had a couple of herniated discs and, and, um, um, bone spurs and, and miscellaneous things like that. But after about, and I was still teaching on stage three day events. I would just work my way through it. And, but I got to a point where I just really couldn't anymore. Um, and every people from the audience would say, you know, what's wrong with you? You know, I could tell there's something wrong and they would give me all types of uh, prescriptions and different things to do. The best thing I did was a 10 day green juice fast. I would have done anything to get out of pain back then. They were giving me pills and I was taking them. I mean, I was doing, I, I, I just needed to get out of pain. 
And uh, I found out some, somebody handed me a book called um, The Mind Body, um, no, Mind Over Back Pain by Dr. John Sarno. And um, he said, hey, read this book, short book. If you see, if you think this book was written for you, then read his next book. And I read the book and I was like, oh my gosh, every page describes me, you know? Uh, and so I read his next book and, and it was all about how your subconscious actually really puts pain, things that uh, anger and pain and things that you don't want to deal with really, really deep. So when you start, when that starts, starts to bubble up into the surface, um, your mind creates pain so you won't deal with the, the, the pain that's actually in your subconscious. So for me, you know, traveling all that time, trying to run a business, uh, you know, having all these different properties, it was really, really stressful. Um, it got to a point where my mind stopped talking to my calf. Um, and wow. so I was walking, I was actually dragging my, my leg. Um, my right foot, it felt like the heel was full of glass. The whole right side of my foot was numb. And I just had pain circulating around my body um, for, and it was, it was really intense. So I read that, I did what it said. I actually went through a writing campaign. If anybody's in pain, by the way, get that book. And then if, you, if the book was written for you, go to a website called TMS Wiki, the Mind Body Syndrome uh, Wiki. Dot wiki and on the left hand side there's what's called structured education this is all free structured education don't go through the don't click the therapy go through the structured education and it's a 40-day writing program that will they tell you specifically what to write about different stresses in your life not for each day and then by the most a lot of people get cured just within like the first 10 12 days I was wow. what they call a, a hard healer it actually took me 60 days Holy but cow. after 60 days of writing and, and doing, you know, other things that it would say to do, like yell at your mind because it's a battle between you and your mind. So the only thing I could do back then was bike so, and on a stationary bike. I didn't trust myself outside. And um, so I would be on that bike in the morning yelling at my mind. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to beat you. <laughs> right. And uh, so um, <clears throat> so I did everything. And I actually one of the guys and I wrote I read all the books on the mind body syndrome. There was a guy up in New Hampshire who was a doctor. I called to see if he was still practicing. He was. So I called him up and I got a, an appointment with him. And he says, so you think you get the mind-body syndrome? And I said, yep. He said, are you 100% sure? I said, I'm 99% sure. He said, what's that other 1%? I said, I saw the MRI of my spine. The bottom third is black from degenerated discs. You know, I got two uh, herniated discs and I've got bone spurs on the top. He says, okay, call me back when you're 100% sure. I was like, what? Aren't you going to help me? He's like, no, this, this is not going to work unless you're 100% sure you get it. And I was like, so I, w I went another week and I thought, I've tried everything. You know, I'm not sleeping. I was sleeping for three half hours a night, not contiguous. Um, and um, so I, I thought, I, I just got to give in wholeheartedly. So I called him back and I said, I'm 100% sure. He said, what do you fear most physically? I said, well, I love to run. I love to work out, but I can't because it causes so much pain. He says, I want, you to, I want you to run a half mile today and I want you to start a weight training program. And then call me, call me next week and give me your progress. And I thought, damn, I can't even run, you know? Uh, but I thought if I'm in 100%, I'm running. So I went outside and I did what I call the hobble. You know, I was dragging that right leg around. I don't know what the neighbors thought, but I went like from telephone pole to telephone pole until I got that half mile in. And uh, I started the, the, the P90X program, which is a body, body weight program. I've done it before, yeah. so I knew what it was like. And that was the start of, of my progress back. And uh, the real thing that um, when I realized I had won was the, it, it, all the trainings tell you that, you know, your mind's going to give you pain and, and known pain paths, pain, pain, places in your past where you've had pain because you'll think, oh, yeah, that's from my old injury where the body only takes six weeks to heal. So, um, so it said when it starts giving you pain in a place where you've never had pain before, that's when it's run out of options and you know you've won if you recognize that. And when I wake up in the when I back then when I would wake up in the morning, I would determine how much pain I was going to be in that day, from a, from how much pain I was in from get, going from a lying position to seated on the end of my bed because that was so painful, and then I would it would um, it would tell me you know it would reaffirm that pain on my first two steps. I would know how much pain I would be in my first two steps for that day. So um, I get from a seated position one morning. And I sat up and I was like, oh my God. And I had all this pain up here in my shoulder, behind my shoulder. And uh, I was sitting there just thinking, oh crap. And I was about to take that first step. And then it hit me. I had never had pain behind the shoulder before, ever in my life. And I thought, I won. I won. I jumped up in the air. I had an armoire with a big mirror there. And I started screaming at that mirror. 
I beat you, MF, I beat you, I won. But the book tells you, you know, that once you realize you've won and the brain realizes that it's gonna lose, it throws all kinds of pain at you. So, so be ready, you'll get pain everywhere. And for the rest of that week, I was just, I was in so much pain. But while I was in so much pain, I was like, I know I won, I know I won. And then I was in Washington, DC doing a three day event. The night of the second day, I was in my hotel room. I never went out because I was in so much pain. And all of a sudden I was watching football, eating a pizza and I realized I'm not in pain anymore. I'm not, I'm not in pain. What am I, should I go out and meet the rest of the crew, you know, and go out to a restaurant with them? And, and I was like, no, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna enjoy this. And that was about five years ago. That was the last time I was in pain. Even though my back still like screwed up, my spine still screwed up, haven't been in pain since. So that just is an example of how life is just one big mind game, you know? That totally. That was a long story, but. And, and you know what? I mean, look, you had all this success, financial success and, you know, visit, visibly you know success from having the you know your company grow and grow um but you're still we're dealing with something you know you're still dealing with life <laughs> issues and you still had to go out and and find a way to learn from other people and that's yeah. you know that's what this is all about so hey let, let me go back because um to your one of your books um let's do the emerging uh, real estate markets. You know, when I think of multifamily markets, um, the kind of the syndicators that I've been around and kind of the education that I've gotten was it, you know, look for markets that are growing in population, growing in income, um, you know, the job growth, um, that type of thing. So is, you know, it's been a while since I read your book. Um, is that kind of the focus of that book? Talk about, you know, what was involved in that book and, and um, what that put, what you put together in that book. Uh, the focus of that particular book is the four phases of a market cycle. Uh, so knowing, you know, how to recognize each particular phase, knowing how to invest in each particular phase, uh, but most importantly, how to recognize the transition of each phase, because that's where most investors will lose money is, is in the transitions. Um, so that so that you could be making money in your own backyard if you can recognize which particular cycle you're in and how they're transitioning, you know, for the rest of your life. And then I go into emerging markets, which are markets that appreciate a lot faster than other markets. Uh, and in our in, in multifamily investing, if the cash flow is great. The cash flow gives you better choices in life, but it's the appreciation that makes you wealthy. So you can get f appreciation through what's called forced appreciation, value adds in your properties, correcting uh, mistakes that, that the property has in management, uh, or you can get it in and or you can get it in emerging markets, markets that, that for the reason of job growth, and that's really the primary factor, job growth, um, that market is moving forward and it moves forward rapidly. So um, you, you mentioned population. Actually, population isn't really a good guide. It's household formations. So because populations can be a difference between deaths and, and, and births and all that. But when you look at household formations and when they're increasing, you know, people are migrating into the area. So um, we look for markets that have 500 or more jobs coming in. OK, as soon as that pops up on our radar, we'll call over to the Economic Development Committee of that particular market. Uh, and we'll ask them, what are you doing? What are you doing to attract jobs? You know, and typically they're doing one of four things. They are uh, giving away free money in terms of grant for businesses to come in um, uh, to build on multifamily or just businesses themselves. Uh, they're giving away uh, free land to build on, uh, like for instance, a Toyota plant in, in San Antonio many years ago, they gave away all that land so Toyota would come down there and build. Uh, and they did and that changed that market. Uh, they're giving uh, tax abatements. Tax abatements are where the, you can come in and you get 10 years of no taxes you know, if you invest in multifamily properties in a particular area. So we're looking for incentives like that, you know, and then if there's one good, if there's a multiple of incentives to bring in, you know, we want to see how aggressive they are. Sure. So if they're really aggressive, that makes for a better market. Um, and then also uh, we look at the leadership and how strong is the leadership? How, how dedicated are they to, to bringing more? And I, the, I get lucky. I started investing in Brockton, Massachusetts, in old shoe city, but, you know, most of the industries had moved out, moved to Europe. There was, it was blighted. There was a lot of, you know, the people that moved into the empty properties were drug dealers and pushers and all that. And then a guy by the name of Jack Units comes in and uh, strong leadership um, and just 
kind of takes the city by the horns and and gets the MBTA from Boston to come down there. So don't, now you don't have to have a car to work in Boston. Uh, five new schools, new sidewalks, uh, new infrastructure. He changed that city. And I was lucky enough to, to start investing when he first came into office. And I didn't know anything about emerging markets at the time. But when I started learning about it, I started recognizing all the all the smart things that Mayor Units did in order to change that city around. And you got to so we look for that. Oh, yeah. He led this huge way for Brockton. And then we look at um, the multiplier effect. So how so for every one job that's created, how many additional ancillary jobs are going to be created as well? And um, some cities uh, have strong multiplier effects, like uh, the city of Montgomery uh, has the most white collar jobs per capita um, of the in the United States. And it has a multiplier effect for every new job coming in of 11. So wow. for one job coming in, it creates 11 more. When I started investing in Montgomery, Alabama, it had a multiplier effect of three. So I knew that when they when the Kia plant was being uh, brought in there and they were going to create 5,000 new jobs, that meant there was actually 20,000 new jobs coming in. And But what they made that market so good back then was the fact that it was surrounded by floodplains and that you can't build in a floodplain. So now we've got 20,000 new people migrating into the area, you know, in a city surrounded by floodplains, which means the supply of multifamilies are going to be constrained. Demand's going to increase. Supply is going to be constrained. That means value is going to go up. So we love uh, areas with higher multipliers, but also areas with barriers to entry. And other barriers to entry are like, the oceans on the east and west coast, a major body of water, uh, a mountain like uh, the city of Phoenix. Um, uh, sometimes it's just as simple as railroad tracks, you know, but, but, but barriers to entries are, are good for markets. That, that's smart. Hey, uh, early on in the conversation, you said you, you know, you were, were, you were at 8,000 units at one point. You went down yeah. to 1,500 and you're about to ramp up. So yeah. I'm interested in hearing your view on the economic cycle on where we're at. I mean, yeah, we, you know, with COVID, we took a, you know, a, a dive in the stock market for two or three weeks. Everybody was scared and then it just took off. Um, now the, the Fed is pumped, you know, you know, the government has pumped a ton of money into the, you know, the economy. Um, the Fed's talking about keeping interest rates low through 2022. Um, People still don't really know whether to believe that we're going to be in an uptrend or do we have a second leg down? Here's the deal with multifamily. Um, now, right now, we're in a, um, a correction. We were supposed to be in a correction right now. It actually started a year ago, February. We assumed it was going to happen right after the election because they would pump the economy up. But it actually started below. Nobody just heard about it. But then the coronavirus hit. You know, and first, you know, as operators, we have to survive it, you know, and then once we figure out how to survive it, then we learn, then we figure out where the opportunity is, because in every crisis is an opportunity. Um, so we all of a sudden we realize there's going to be a bunch of properties coming onto the marketplace. And the reason there's going to be a bunch of properties coming onto the marketplace is because we've just been through almost a 10 year up cycle. And that 10 year up cycle created a lot of sloppy investors. And the reason it did is because. People start investing, okay? They don't either analyze right or they don't buy properly. Uh, but yet that mistake is never exposed because as the market rises, the rents increase and the value increases. So the market actually corrects their mistakes. So they don't learn from their mistake and they continue as a sloppy investor and they continue to do it, continue to do it. Uh, and, the, and the market continues to correct them until something happens like a pandemic. And like a naked man at the beach at low tide they became exposed. And see, it was so sexy to go out and do deals. It was so sexy to go out and raise funds for these deals. It was so sexy to get these acquisition fees, but it wasn't sexy to learn how to asset manage properly. And there's a lot of people out there that never really learned how to asset manage properly. They didn't have to because you know they weren't getting any negative consequences from it because of the market increasing. And and now, you know, when you when you really need those those asset management skills, they didn't have them. So they've been the, through a period of time. Some have already lost their properties. Those are the deals that are trickling onto the market. But there's a huge wave coming onto the market. CoStar Analytics predicted that, that um, I think it was 14% of all commercial uh, loans were going to come back onto the market within a three to four month period of time. And we think that's going to happen right around the summertime, uh, early fall uh, for this cycle. So just for a three to four month period of time, they're going to all hit at the same time. 
Um, that's just uh, um, CoStar with, and they were talking about CMBS, commercial mortgage backed securities. We also have Freddie Mac, we have Fannie Mae, and we have the FHA that also have these types of deals that are gonna be hitting the marketplace. So um, CoStar predicted that these deals that get foreclosed on, now the smart investors that realize that they weren't good operators, you know, that weren't trying to hang on, they've already sold into the market and they've got good prices. They didn't have to sell at a discount because at the same time of what's going on, we have people that had invested in office and retail that got hammered by the, the COVID crisis. You know, they're, 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 they're flighting to safety. They're going into multifamily properties with their funds. So therefore we didn't see the downturn happen as soon as we expected it because of this reason. But there's gonna be so many properties coming onto the marketplace come summertime, fall, uh, that, that, that those people, they, they can't adjust the market like they have. You know, there's just gonna be this opportunity. It's gonna be for a short window, three to four months, but it's gonna be there. And those that are prepared, you know, you just wanna grab, you wanna back up the pickup truck and fill it up to the brim because so that is life changing well. Do you believe that it will include all, all asset classes or mainly uh, uh, in the hospitality and office and retail sectors? I'm just talking about multifamily. So you so you, be, you believe in multifamily that latter part of this year, so late part of summer, going into fall, you're going to have people that are having to put their properties up. And already, now are, are those it's already happening? It's already happening. Okay, so it's already happening. Those deals are trickling in. We're getting one-off deals now, but there's going to be a point now when, like, you know, I'm an emerging markets investor. So what we do is we look at like the optimal markets to invest in, and I and I do what we call staking a flag. So we'll stake a flag in that market, and we'll buy three to five to seven deals in that market because we know based on all the analytics that market's going to appreciate. It's going to appreciate rapidly. <clears throat> but you know, the last three or four years, there hasn't been a market where you can buy three, five, seven deals in. So you, you've only been able to do one-off deals. But when this wave hits. You know, there are already markets, I can tell you, Dallas, uh, Las Vegas, um, Orlando. These markets are going to be good markets to get into. Um, these markets are going to see a, a huge amount of these foreclosures. Even though actually every, in everybody's backyard, it's not going to be discriminatory as to whether it's going to be emerging market or not. There are so many um, uh, I, bad managers, for lack of a better phrase, that these are going to pop up in everybody's backyard. That's why it's great. I mean, if you ever thought about investing in multifamily, Get your feet wet in your own backyard, learn about emerging market, emerging market investing, and then take the knowledge from there and then start really exploding your your wealth and appreciation. That that's interesting. I mean, I'm in the Dallas market and it's mm. still hot and hot and hot. Yeah, it's and, so hot. And, you know. Um, so it's it's interesting to hear your perspective that, you know, come six months from now, you know, it's probably gonna be a different different market. It will. All things cycle. All things change. Dallas has been such a great market because, you know, there's there's so much great opportunity there. And then when there's a downturn, it only goes down for a little bit, you know, and then the government steps in. They're, they're, it's a great business government there and it recovers, recovers quicker than most markets. Actually, the best two states to do business in long term are Texas and Utah because of the governments are so business friendly. That makes sense. That makes sense. So. What do you do from from here? Like, what what's your next big stretch goal? I'm uh, kind of hanging out and waiting for this market <laughs> to turn. <laughs> you know, I'm relaxing. I've actually I've got three kids now. Uh, there are I've got twins on uh, about four and a half, and I've got one that's two and a half. So I'm spending a lot of time with them, uh, and they're keeping me really really busy. Um, we're we're training people here at Ari Mentor on how to take advantage of this next opportunity that's about to hit. And um, yeah, I'm really relaxing. This is this will be my third market cycle, you know. So I know what's coming. I know how busy I'm going to be. So I'm taking this time to we like I've got a partner, and he's like, we got to do a deal. We got to do a deal. Like, no, we we don't have to do a deal. <laughs> There's going to be so many deals coming in. We want to do a right deal. We don't want to do a deal. We want to do the right deal. And uh, there's going to be a lot of right deals coming in. Soon. That's that's interesting. Now, what about outside of outside of work and outside of family? What do you what do you enjoy doing? Um, I do triathletes. I did an you, Ironman really? back in 2013. Yeah, I did. A, Even with I, I all, went to an Iron, you, you what? had all that back pain and, and you do No, that came after. I thought it was because of the try. I actually was a power lifter too. And I won the New Hampshire AAUs back in 2000. And I said to the, the back doctor that I went to, I was going to have that operation where they fused everything. And, um, I said, you know what? I, you know, I trained for that Ironman and I did all that power lifting. That's the reason I get such a bad back. 
And he said, no, he said, that's the reason you have a good back. That's the reason that your back is the way it is. If you, if you didn't do those things, you'd be a lot worse off. And he actually told me, he said, if you can, if you can bear with this pain for the next year, Okay, the chances of you being better from the operation are about two or three percent. He said, so if you can deal with the pain, then I suggest you not take the operation. This is the guy that was going to make money. Give me the operation. Right. I was like, wow. And, and that's reiterated. I hadn't met Dr. Sarno at that point. But in the uh, in the future readings, that was reiterated again in, in those books, too. Don't do the operation if you, if you if you can stand it. So do you still do the triathlons now? <laughs> Yeah. So we're training for, because of COVID, you know, they haven't been having the events. So me, my brother, and a couple of friends created our own event. We're doing it April 10th. We're going to swim a mile at the local pool. We, we did a 14 mile bike route uh, and we've got a five mile run behind that. That's an Olympic sized triathlon. Um, so we're going to do that. We got ourselves our own medals for that. And That's awesome. but we've already signed up for a couple during the year as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, we really, you know, what we really like is those obstacle races, you know, Spartan races, Spartan, and Savage uh, race Tough and... Mudder. I've done Tough Mudder. I've done a, a little sprint on Spartan, but I haven't done the, the, the big time. The beast. Um, yeah. I don't, do you know a guy by the name of Ivan Barrett out mm, of Indy? No. So I uh, had him on the show and he, he's a big multifamily guy and um, he's doing some Spartan race. That's like a 39 hour deal where oh man you, you go up that's the, like you hike up the top of the mountain in U utah and then you come back down on the on the tram then you go back up i don't i forget how many times but crazy um oh, i can tell you i did i did the beast and we did it at killington uh ski area in in uh, vermont and we had to climb up and down that mountain three times it took us 14 hours to do the entire race i mean that was a beast once is enough some of these things you do is like once is enough I used you to know? ski, you know, because I grew up in Connecticut, and we used to go to Killington, ski down. I can't imagine more going <laughs> yeah, up. <laughs> so, hey, how do people uh, reach out and get to know you better, and what you know, everything that you guys have to offer? If if a they, listener wants to to get to know you better, yeah, they can reach us at R E Mentor uh, R E is in Real Estate Mentor dot com. Um, you can call the office seven eight one eight seven eight. 7114. Um, or I've got a, a free book offer. Uh, it's my multifamily millions book. It's the icon book. This has started so many different investors off to their careers. Um, and uh, so pay shipping and handling seven ninety five. dollars uh, It's cheaper than to get it from Amazon. Amazon is $23 today. Uh, so we'd be happy to send you this plus a bunch of bonuses as well that you wouldn't get from Amazon. So, so you how, get that, get that at Dave that? today, davetoday.com. Dave, Dave today. Yep. Sorry. DaveToday.com and uh, just go in there and um, fill it out. And we'll be happy to send that to you. Plus the bonuses. One of the bonuses is an emerging markets poster. Gives you the four phases of the market cycle. Gives you the key characteristics and gives you the key strategies. You can pin it right up in your wall so you can understand that, what different markets awesome. you're in. So I paid full boat for that. So yeah. listeners, you know, take take advantage of that. Um, it was one of the books that I I read early on. And um, it was a great book, and I actually opened it up, took it off my bookshelf today, and I was looking through it, and I, I have all kinds of scribble marks in there, um, highlight and stuff. And um, so take advantage of that. That was davetoday.com, and get your free um, copy of that. And um, really appreciate you coming on. Um, great to know you. Uh, listeners, I hope you enjoyed that one. And until next week, sign off. Thank you for watching Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. If you liked the episode, please click the like button and subscribe to the show. If you already are subscribed, then thank you. And please share the show with a friend. Check out other free resources at darrenbatchelder.com slash learn. 